I think it's often very much, um, you know, misrepresented uh, in the media today. Um, hopefully, you will walk away with a different understanding of what self care is and why it matters, why it's necessary in each of our lives, um, and why we need to make time for it. So, just to begin, um, the very beginning point is how stressors today differ from stressors, you know, decades and centuries ago. And there is a very drastic difference um, in the way that they present themselves. Now, the way that our body was designed was uh, for self-preservation, right? So um, the maximization uh, or the minimization of harm and the maximization of benefit. And harm really was in the form of, you know, um, predators and, and you know, um, animals and about survival. And um, that's how we were wired to be able to protect ourselves from a fight or flight perspective. So we either, you know, confront the stressor or we flee from the stressor. And what happens is, um, you know, centuries ago, um, the way that the world was designed was in a way that you would just flee from the, you know, the, the threat in your environment. You wouldn't necessarily, uh, or you could face it, but you could also flee, but there was some type of physical response from the body. And today, the stressors drastically differ in the sense that there isn't necessarily something that you're going to flee. You know, there isn't something that you can run away from. Um, and not many people actually confront or face their stressors. And so stress today looks very different in the sense of relationship dynamics, you know, the relationship you have with your spouse, or if you're trying to get married, or the relationship you have with your children, um, the relationship that you have with yourself and with your creator and with your community. And so all of these different relationship dynamics are actually... Um, add on immense stress to one's load. Also the stress of traffic, right? And right now we may not necessarily be experiencing that head on. Um, everybody's working from home, you know, online schooling, um, all of the events as such as the one today are taking place online. And so that also, you know, plays a role in, in added stressors. Your work and degree deadlines and responsibilities you know, I really believe that these times that we live in, um, you know, irrespective of the pandemic, are really, you know, a test. We're being tested with ease as opposed to being tested with, um, you know, adversity because previous generations were more about survival. You know, we have to be able to get food on the table. I have to provide the best education for my children. Um, it really was about how to make ends meet in a country that is not necessarily my country um, that I grew up in. And so this is a country that I have to transition into, an environment that I have to acclimate to and adjust to. And so that triggers very much survival. I'm just trying to survive in this new place. I'm trying to learn the language, uh, trying to get accustomed to the different ways in which I can navigate the system. And so that is a test that is different. Our test today is very different than our past generations in this country, because we're not so much about survival now. We're more about you know, um, thriving and thriving also comes with a certain type of awareness of what we need to unlearn from past generations, but also the incredible strengths that we can take from past generations, because we can't just, we don't wanna unlearn everything. And there are many incredible strengths um, that we can draw from past generations that we need to kind of learn from today. Um, so today, our test is very different, um, again, in the sense that it is one of ease. We have a plethora of options, right? We have many different degrees that we can choose from. Uh, food options, right? Housing options. Um, options of friends and where you want to live and where you want to travel. All of these are different types of, you know, uh, tests um, or afflictions or tribulations or trials that we are presented with. And again, they're very different in nature. And so there isn't necessarily in any of these examples that I have mentioned, when you're stuck in traffic, you can't exactly get out of the car and, and flee from traffic. You actually sit in traffic for hours and hours on end every single week, right? 365 days a year. 
um, minus weekends perhaps. But that is an accumulation of stressors that take a toll on the body. And that's just traffic as one example. Imagine that you're sitting you know, in your workstation um, in the workplace, in your work environment, and you're being bombarded with emails and deadlines and you need to change this and I, I need to request that from you and you need to submit this. And so these are also another form of stressors that you can't exactly flee from and you can confront them. But we will talk about when the, that stressor is over. Let's say you submit something for a deadline that you had. What ends up happening to the stress in your body? So the stressor is gone, but the stress is still residing. And this is actually something that we need to address and talk about and in, in the context of self-care. Now, our stress response, again, today differs, and we often can't run from them. So they end up accumulating to a degree of overwhelm. No self-care without self-concept. When you look into research studies that talk about this concept of self-care, and I think that's really important to present because I don't want to just present a um, the average perspective on what self-care is. What I found in many research studies is that, you know, individuals who really don't understand this concept of self-care or resist it, and I found that to be very often the case in past generations. Um, the reason for that is, it's not because they don't, they don't like the idea, but they just don't find utility in the idea. They don't really understand what it's about. What does it mean to take care of myself other than just eating and sleeping and, you know, taking care of my very basic needs. Um, but they don't really see much beyond that. And I found the reason is that one, the first and foremost reason that I come across is that that individual doesn't really know themselves. You don't know yourself as, as, in, as someone who has agency, who's autonomous, who has your own identity. And the reason for that is, is that our cultures have really driven this concept of enmeshment. And part of being in a collectivistic society is a beautiful thing because your struggles are shared, your joys are shared and multiplied. However, at the same time, you are functioning so much as one body that you don't necessarily know how to separate from that body at times. And who am I in the absence of that society or that community or that family unit? And so oftentimes this is a struggle because when we talk about self-care, we're not necessarily talking about community care and that is an aspect of it. But self-care is really for me as an individual, caring for myself, you know, to ensure that my basic needs are met, but also a little bit beyond my basic needs. Because I think our understanding of basic needs is just, again, food, sleep, and, and intimate connection. However, there's a lot more to it than that. And so the first and foremost reason for why I don't place value in this concept of self-care is because I don't necessarily know myself. I don't necessarily know who I am. And so therefore, I just view myself as part of a unit. And when I view myself as part of a unit, I don't really think about, well, what do I need? And this is really a type of programming that is missing from past generations that I have encountered. Also, this concept of how can you care for something which you don't know? So I cannot care for something or, or meet the needs of something that I actually do not know, I have no familiarity with. So again, when I don't know how to break away from that family unit or from that community unit, um, then I don't really know me as an individual, what do I need? What am I in need of that I can provide or cater to or address? And so this is where much of the resistance lies. Also, what is your identity rooted in? And so we all wear multiple hats and there are studies that allude to this fact that the more hats that you wear the more happy you are and that of course goes back to this concept of we all have a need to belong we all want to feel like we're needed and this is oftentimes why if you are a parent listening in then you will really understand this concept of when your children grow up and they move on then you know, this is really um, 
a big part of this empty nest syndrome that you feel. I no longer feel needed and I want to feel needed. I need to feel like there is some utility for me. I, am, I need to be utilized for something. Someone needs to rely on me for something. Someone leans on me for something. And so a lot of individuals, you know, when their children leave the house, they find volunteering, they, they have careers, they have things that they can turn to, to continue the cycle of feeling needed because that is necessary to thrive. But you need to identify what your core identity is. And for us as Muslims, I think we tend to forget this ayah, you know, and so it's understanding that our purpose is really rooted in this concept and that I am first and foremost, before I am anything else to anyone else or to myself, I am a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm here being utilized, whether I realize it or not, for the sake of something, you know, for the purpose of something. And so knowing that that is my first identity, and then everything else is kind of a ripple effect that follows, right? Then you are a daughter, right? Or a son, and then you are a spouse, right? Or a sibling, and then a spouse, and then a parent, right? And then you are, you know, an engineer or a, um, a caretaker uh, or a housewife, or you are a teacher or a clinician, whatever it is that you might be, everything else follows. But we must understand our root identity and when I understand that root identity, I also understand the obligation that comes with that. Because that identity is one that I will be held accountable for. How did you take care of this amana? How did I take care of my body? And how will I return this body back to the creator when my time is up? What, what condition will it be in? What state will my mind be in, my soul, my body? And so the dimensions of a human being, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is that he broke it down into really four things, right? And that was the ruh, which is the soul, which here um, is the spiritual. Then he has the qalb, which is the emotional, right? Which is the ihsas. That's, that's where all the ihsas stems from, or the sensations or feelings or senses. And then you have the aql, which is the mind, which is the psychological. And then you have the nafs, which is the physical. And we know that there are two... Um, you know, different, I guess, nutrients that we were created from. One of them being the soul, which is the divine, and then the body, which is really from the earth. And that is what our body will decompose back into, which is the earth. And so we cannot care for ourselves if I do not deposit something into each and every single one of these dimensions on a daily basis on a daily basis. This is when we talk about being whole and complete as a human being as much as possible. These are really the dimensions that we have to look at. These are the dimensions that we have to tend to. And just like we deposit amounts in our bank accounts, we also have these accounts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we actually have to ensure that we are making deposits into on a daily basis. Now, where did this concept of self-care really come from? So we have it in our faith. It's embedded in our own faith. However, there's been such an increase um, in hearing about this concept, you know, everywhere you go. And it's almost as though it's like this newfound awareness. However, it's not. Um, there were initially substantial deficits in professional medical resources in North America and Western Europe after World War II. And this led to the rise in the development and investment in healthcare. And upon, you know, investing in healthcare, right, it came, the, it came to defining the role of the medical practitioner who is servicing the patients. And when they talked about primary prevention, right, an author um, with the last name of Last, he documented that for every category of disease, what physicians saw was only the tip of the iceberg. So whenever you have a patient that is coming in with a complaint or reporting certain symptoms or symptomatology, you would look at their case and then what you're seeing is only the tip of the iceberg because the experience is so much deeper than that for the patient. 
So they're not necessarily, and sometimes actually what I've encountered in the mental health you know, field, forget the medical field itself, is that a lot of individuals don't know how to put terms to what it is that they're feeling or thinking in their body, in their mind, and in their soul, because each one senses different things. And this is oftentimes what leads to a state of overwhelm. And when you're overwhelmed, you don't know how to really describe or put a name to the feeling or to the type of experience that you're having. And so part of being a practitioner or a medical clinician is that you are able to help empower your patient or your client in understanding the different terms to be able to understand what is happening to them. Now, Horder and Horder found that less than one third of illnesses experienced were treated by healthcare professionals. It's of no surprise that there's approximately 85% of symptoms that individuals never go to see a doctor for, right? Or they never go to see a mental practitioner for. Um, and I think the statistics vary between mental health and then the medical profession. But this is telling. This is telling because this shows you the necessity as well for self-care. Because if there are so many things that we experience in our body and in our mind and in our soul that we actually do not talk to anyone about that is equipped to be able to help us or give us the tools to deal with or to treat or heal from, then that means that there is so much that is untended to. There is so much that is being neglected because we tend to minimize things. We come from a culture that it greatly minimizes things, right? And so these studies are not talking about our cultures in particular, but it is talking about a general picture of the human condition is that, and especially for us as Muslims, um, or anyone who happens to be non-Muslim also who's listening, is that you know, we tend to minimize things as human beings because we don't want to feed into things. We don't want to think that something is wrong with us. So instead of empowering ourselves to deal with whatever it is that we have or what, whatever it is that we're facing, we actually want to just sweep it under the rug and we don't want to deal with it. So many of the symptoms that individuals experience are actually untended to. Now, initial descriptive self-care research concerned the types of actions taken in response to illness. Right. Now, our nature as human beings, according to Dr. Kelly McGonigal, she's a health psychologist with Stanford University. She's done extensive research on stress and health and well-being, et cetera. And she wrote The Willpower Instinct, which I highly recommend for everyone to read, because our biggest muscle that we need to develop as Muslims is our willpower muscle. And this also relates to self-care in the sense that the biggest act of self-care is strengthening my willpower muscle. Because upon that, the tenets of my faith rely. So according to Dr. McGonigal, McGonigal she said that when given a choice of anything, you know, you're presented with, with multiple choices for anything, people tend to choose over and over what's against their long-term interests. So we're not wired to think about our short-term benefits. We generally think about, or long-term benefits, sorry, we generally think about our short-term gain. So what can I gain from this, you know, in this instance or in this moment, um, as opposed to how will this affect me if I go ahead with this, you know, a year from now, six months from now, five years from now, we don't generally think this way. And this is a big problem when it comes to our willpower. Now we're also often, what she found, it doesn't relate necessarily to being weak. You know, even though we know that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he has created the human being as weak. Now, one of the side effects of being weak is that you will experience exhaustion and fatigue. And so Dr. McGonigal talks about from her studies is that we're often too fatigued to act against our own worst impulses. So we will have many tendencies and inclinations that are not positive, you know, and if we, if we were to feed into them and follow them, they could actually be very detrimental and harmful for our health and our well-being, whether it be psychological, emotional, physical, or spiritual. So she's saying that we're often too tired 
to be able to act against those impulses that are actually not good for us. So we can't also control everything. And this is the paradox of willpower is that we can't control everything because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the master controller. But we can also, but we also need to increase our self-control by stretching our limited capacities. And she alluded to this fact that the only way to do this is by pacing ourselves. And it's really interesting because we have built into our faith this concept of salah, which comes from sila or connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're wired for connection. But we are primarily wired for connection with our creator. And this actually is what she is referring to, pacing yourself, right? We have this embedded in our faith because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us to pace ourselves by strengthening our willpower by praying five times throughout the day. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a little bit. We have a willpower muscle is what she also uh, you know, uh, ex you know, uh, expounded upon. And she stated that you either use it or lose it. Just like the muscles in our body, when they're not used, right, they kind of dwindle and they become, you know, very, you know, you start to sag in all areas because there's no toning, there's no muscle toning. And so it's exactly the same thing that you have a willpower muscle that you need to strengthen. And the only way to do that, again, is by pacing yourself and doing small acts that strengthen your willpower on a daily basis. Now, this relates to self-care in many ways. Our three needs as human beings are safety, satisfaction, and connection. And when I talk about safety, the, primarily what I'm really talking about is psychological safety. And it's that feeling that you get when you're with someone and you actually feel like you can talk to them about what what it, what you know, uh, what is really uh, paining you, what is really causing you so much pain and anxiety and overwhelm. And you feel like you don't have to have your guards up with this person. You can actually lower your guard and connect with this person. And that I actually feel psychological safety with this person. And so we have this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we can actually talk and communicate with Allah all the time, all day, every day. We don't need an appointment. We don't need to schedule anything. We can actually just connect with our creator at any moment of the day, which is the utmost mercy, if you think about it. So psychological safety with Allah, but also we need safety with other human beings, other human beings who I share space with, who I actually feel safe in the company of. Now, the second one is satisfaction. And that is when I feel a sense of fulfillment, you know, with what I'm doing, with my purpose, with how I spend my time. And the third is connection, and that is really connection with our creator and connection to ourself, because you can dissociate from self. This is what trauma does, if it, you know, quantifies as trauma. And then also connection with other people, with other loved ones, which really triggers oxytocin or activates oxytocin to be released in the brain, and that's known as the bonding hormone. And that is how you thrive. Now, when the brain senses that all three of these needs are actually being met, you actually find yourself in the green zone. And the green zone, green was actually our, our beloved Dali Hisalat Wasalam's favorite color, but is also the safe zone. So when you're surrounded by nature, you feel a sense of safety, you feel a sense of comfort, you feel a sense of peace and tranquility and serenity. And that is what the color green does, right? But it also, is your brain's default mode. This is the mode that you need to be in as often as possible. And this is the sustainable mode as well. This is how I can actually thrive, not just survive, right? And this is my resting state. Your body has the rest and digest nervous system, but it also has the fight, flight, or freeze nervous system. You want to be in the rest and digest nervous you know, nervous system, that aspect of the nervous system. And that is where you will feel peace, satisfaction, and love as a result of the need for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Now, your stress response is the red zone. And this is the area of great discomfort. This is the area of fear, anxiety, shutdown, and overwhelm. And this is also where your body 
burns internal resources much faster than it can actually intake them. So whatever resources that you actually have internally, you are burning them off very quickly to a point of, you know, complete extinction. You actually don't have any more of it. And your system is actually greatly disturbed. So it's not in a state of homeostasis or equilibrium. It's in a state of being all over the map, right? So one minute you're feeling anxious, the next minute you're terrified, the next minute you're, you know, you're feeling stomach upset because the stress response triggers your digestive system. Hence why a lot of individuals experience stomach upset, they crave carbs, um, they find themselves, you know, for using the bathroom frequently. And this is also relating to the hadith in which we are told that many, you know, all diseases lie in the gut. And so there is a stress and gut connection that actually many medical uh, providers or hakims can, can, can discuss and often do in their material and their content um, that relate to this fact that stress wreaks havoc on your system. And thus, this is another reason why self-care becomes mandatory in order to restore balance, restore homeostasis, and just, you know, push your body in a state of restoration. Now, the brain reacts in non-sustainable bursts, so it's not continuous, but it tends to be in, in the form of bursts of stress that you feel that in the short term, there is positive stress, which is called eustress, which was termed by Hans Selye, who was a physician, but also um, you stress is, is positive in the sense it could be marriage, it could be having a baby, it could be getting a promotion, it could be buying a home. And all of these are, are great things. However, they do come with a sense of stress to them. Because, for example, with a baby, you have many sleepless nights. You're no longer your own person in that season of life. Um, your baby may have many needs, many demands, especially if your baby ha is, you know, has special needs. There is another added layer of stress to the mother. Now, um, you know, when we talk about negative stressors, what I'm really talking about is transitioning from a U stress, a positive stressor, into a negative stressor. And that means that I've passed the two week mark, usually. So if I've been experiencing, you know, immense stress and overwhelm, every single day for a period of two weeks, you go past the two weeks, this is typically identified as prolonged stress. And this is when it begins to really impact your immune system. Now there's a, there's a concept known as allostatic load. And that really refers to the wear and tear on the body as a result of prolonged stressors, not necessarily use stress, positive stressors, but negative stressors that take place in small bursts every single day or, or larger bursts on a daily basis. You're not, you're not tending to yourself. You're continuing to produce and exert yourself and expend energy. And eventually what that leads to is a pile up, almost as though you are piling up um, you know, garbage, one on top of the other. What ends up happening is it starts to mold and starts to rot. And there's a lot of toxicity in the air as a result of that load of garbage. So it's a very similar effect internally is that it all adds up, piles up, and then it starts to lead to a collapse in the body in which the body signals to you that I can no longer do this. And this is when you begin to shut down, which necessarily sometimes can be freeze mode, which is a depression. Now, stress response has a beginning. You know, and this is what we often don't, don't think about, and this is what we often don't address, is that your stress response cycle in your body has a beginning, middle, and an end. We are very good at, you know, addressing the beginning. So what's the immediate stressor? I have this deadline, you know, I didn't complete it. I don't know what I'm going to tell my boss, my supervisor, my didn't turn in my assignment, my professor. This is going to be a really big issue. Maybe I'll get, you know, kicked out of the college or the university or the program. And so these are all very legitimate stressors. However, right, we think that when we address the stressor, that the stress is now gone. However, that is far from being the case. Now, 
We'll transition into what self-care is, and then we'll talk about completing the stress cycle. What is self-care and why does it matter and why is it absolutely critical and necessary and not selfish? It's actually a form of mercy and displaying self-compassion um, for each and every single one of us. Now, self-care is a form of slowing down reactivity because when we are stressed out, we're highly emotionally reactive. So you will feel constantly like you are at the edge of the cliff and every small wind or, or any car passing by or any individual walking very calmly past you, not triggering you, you will identify that as a trigger and everything will start to bother you and everything will start to irritate you. And I know that many people can relate to this experience, especially in the pandemic, when everything changed suddenly for everyone. But also self-care is also a restoration of body to a state of balance, because when you are exposed to a stressor, again, we said that you are knocked out of state of equilibrium. And so you are no longer feeling balanced and, and at peace within yourself. You're not grounded. And so restoring balance is a part of self-care. There is a disconnect in modern life today between what activates the stress response cycle and completes it. Because again, we said that we're no longer being chased by animals and lions or predators that we can actually run away from. And that process of running helps your body to de-stress and restore itself back to a state of equilibrium and homeostasis. We're not running. And we are not fleeing from things in order for that homeostasis to be restored. We are sitting at desks. We are at home. We are dealing with issues and stressors and flooded and being bombarded with them from every angle. And so therefore, how are you actually completing your stress response cycle? And so this is critical to complete the cycle because the stressor is there. You are trying to meet the stressor in some ways. You are making phone calls. You are typing things. You are sending emails, you are communicating, perhaps you're not doing any of those things as well. You're in a state of freeze and you have just shut down because you don't know what to do. And so therefore running or physical activity is necessary. Any type of physical activity is necessary in order for you to complete the stress cycle response. And so Another way of completing the stress cycle, right, according to Emily and Amelia Nagoski, who have actually researched this concept of completing the stress cycle, is a 20 second hug. And that is something that potentially all of us can do. Um, you know, you can hug a friend, you can hug a parent, you can hug a loved one, you can hug a spouse or a child. And if it's 20 seconds, then I really hope it's somebody that you like, because that's a very, you know, awkwardly long time to be hugging anyone that you don't like. And so it actually has to be someone that you feel a sense of psychological safety with, someone that you actually like in order for it to signal to your brain that, hey, I'm no longer in a state of danger. I'm no longer exposed to a threat. It is safe now. You can calm down, right? You can restore yourself back to a state of balance and peace. Also, the third thing that is definitely, you know, not necessarily the third in its order is getting a good night's sleep. And when people tell you to sleep on things and you'll feel better in the morning, that could not be more true because the more that you understand sleep and the benefits, and there are way too many benefits for us to even address, but sleep is related to the, you know, a lack of sleep or sleep deprivation is related to cancer autoimmune diseases, right? Uh, prolonged stress in the body that is actually not alleviated or mitigated in any way. And so you will continue to feel stressed out because you're sleeping late. The liver is not properly detoxing from the cortisol, which is related, which is the stress hormone. And so therefore you wake up and you still have cortisol running in your bloodstream and you still don't feel much better. You don't feel rested. You don't feel relaxed or balanced in any way or grounded. And so getting a good night's sleep, preferably, you know, maintaining the same time in which you sleep every day is critical. Also sleeping by 11 or before 11 p.m. is also critical for many reasons. 
and, and sleeping for approximately seven to eight hours, right, is also very important. Now, some individuals say, well, the Prophet actually did not sleep very often. But we also know that the Prophet mirrored the cycles of nature in the sense of that they slept, you know, the Prophet and the Sahaba slept, you know, after Aisha prayer. So Aisha prayer comes in fairly early. And so when you sleep, when you sleep right after Aisha and you wake up in the last third of the night, that's a significant portion of sleep right there that can actually help you uh, maintain balance and well being in your body. Now, when we talk about also um, self care, self care is not just one type of self care. And so, you know, when you think about self care, this concept, you think about painted nails and, and massages and, um, you know, um, relaxation. And of course, relaxation and all of these things are, are critical. However, it's not just those things because we are much more than just a body which has emotions and physical, biological needs and psychological needs as well. But we also have a ruh or a soul that actually has many needs as well. And this is something that is greatly overlooked because you will meet many individuals who are in a state of agitation, who are in a state of anxiety, who are in a state of internal stress, but they actually do not recognize that this stress and this anxiety and this, you know, depressive states at times, there is definitely a biological component, but at times is not related to anything biological. And this is the thing, because individuals will oftentimes go to the physician, they will go to the doctor, um, they will, you know, investigate and explore every avenue to figure out what is it that is actually wrong with me. I can't figure out what is wrong. Now, sometimes, there is actually something biological, but the doctors are not really doing their part to figure out what is wrong. They're not, you know, administering the right tests to be able to decipher, you know, is there actually a condition here or is this actually constructed in the mind, which is very possible because we know that somatic uh, pain is a very real thing. So what I mean by somatic pain as well as anything felt in the body in the, in the form of pain. So individuals, for example, who experience fibromyalgia, Fibromyalgia is a heightened sensation of pain in the body. And sometimes you feel like that pain is traveling to different parts of the body. So one day you'll feel like it's your appendix and another day you'll feel like it's your liver and another day it will be in your back. And you're gonna be very confused because you're like, am I dying? What is actually wrong with me? Why do I have pain in all these different parts of my body? So this is you know, usually an indication that it could be something psychological, but it could also be something biological and you need to visit a practitioner or medical practitioner in order for you to be able to run all of the appropriate tests as a form of self-care to be able to distinguish, is this something biological? Is this something psychological? Is this something emotional or also is this something physical? And you know, once you've done all of that, there are some individuals, there's a category of individuals who do not find anything. And so they are met with one, you know, one no after the other, after the other. And it's like, you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have that. So you, by process of elimination, you've actually ruled out many conditions. And so the big things are, you know, you don't have anything worrisome in that sense, it's not anything biological. Now, there is a type of spiritual agitation that the soul experiences as a result of being disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this must be also addressed and thought about and, and really reflected upon because we have to assess what is my relationship like first and foremost with my creator? How am I applying self-care practices in this area? Because there is a great disconnect today in, as a result of modernity as a result of our lifestyles, as a result of being extremely distracted and on the go all the time. And I think one thing that heightened issues for, for everyone to a degree is the pause that came with the pandemic. So the pandemic came along, but then also our lives greatly slowed down. And for many people that's problematic because they were on the go every single day for a reason. 
And that reason perhaps is they don't want to face something. They don't want to think about something. Their, their thoughts haunt them and they greatly perturb them. And so they don't want to think about their past. They don't want to think about where they're headed. They don't want to think about all the problems that they have at home or with their loved ones or with their, within their own selves. And so they tend to just distract themselves and busy themselves. And we know that we have a disease of being busy in, with modernity. And it doesn't really allow room for us to face ourselves in a very real and authentic and genuine way. We don't really want to look at the person within because that will require making certain realizations that will require having to face things head on. And that will require a lot of heart work um, a lot of inner work. And that is the hardest form of work that you will ever have to do in your life. And you will know this because children, if you have children, children will also be the biggest trigger for that. And I use the word trigger intentionally because they will, um, there will be friction in a sense that will bring to the surface a lot of your own childhood wounds and in issues and unresolved emotions um, and unresolved needs, really. That's really what it comes down to, is your inner child had a lot of needs that were perhaps unmet. And so you may be an adult, but you still have a child. It's still a child within that adult body. And this is what we must understand, is what are the needs of that child that were unmet? because this could be the greatest act of compassion that you can do for yourself. And also, you know, for your, for your soul, for your emotions, for your biological well-being as well. Now, spiritual self-care, you know, ignore the, the right hand side image. And I'm sorry, it's, it's quite blurry. I tried to fix that. It didn't really fix itself. Um, but when we talk about spiritual self-care, it's really contemplation you know, tadabbur. It's this concept of, you know, and Allah tells us, Quran. Do they not reflect and contemplate on the meanings within the Quran? Because that is a form of spiritual self-care. I can draw many nutrients from that which I'm reading, from the gems within the Quran that it can actually enrich me and broaden my perspectives and do a lot of cognitive restructuring, because this is really what the Quran does, right? Because what we see is not, you know, what we believe is not based on what we see, right? Um, what we see is actually based on what we believe. And this is, this is why we have the Qur'an, because the Qur'an teaches us how to see the world, right? So when we invest in, you know, spending time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dedicating time to the Qur'an, you know, dedicating time to being able to understand what are, what is obligated from us. What are we supposed to do and why? You know, why are these things necessary? So understanding that is critical. So that is tadabbur. Tadabbur allows for you, it's a vehicle that allows for you to attain this type of understanding. Now, muhasaba is also critical in the sense of holding ourselves to account before we are held to account. And that is really, you know, what kind of person am I? You know, what type of impact do I have on people around me? Perhaps I'm narcissistic. Perhaps I am uh, too intense. Perhaps I'm too demanding. Perhaps I'm very neglectful. Perhaps I am very um, too optimistic that I actually dismiss and invalidate the emotions of other people. And if I don't take time to hold myself accountable and also do muraqaba, incorporate muraqaba, which is self-observation, being able to zoom out of myself and view myself from a bird's eye view, and take note, make act, take actual notes about what you realize from things that are said by your loved ones, you know, remarks that they make, whether harshly or gently, that's not the matter. That's not, that's not the issue here. The issue here is what is the content of what is being said? And that is critical for us to take into account before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us into account. Because I think the more um, the lighter one is when we take ourselves into account because then we can actually rectify, enhance, polish, repair, and make right. And if we don't incorporate muhasaba and muraqaba, we're in big trouble. 
because we're just on the go, we're cruising, and we think that everything is okay, but everything could really not be okay, but we would have no idea because we're not holding ourselves accountable. Now, I alluded earlier to this concept in Soleil and its connection to self-control. Research findings point to the fact that um, Soleil is not coincidental, it's not haphazard, it's not just this, these motions that we go through. Um, they're similar to moves in yoga in a lot of ways, but also, um, of course, they also touch upon certain acupressure points, which is found in Chinese medicine, but also in addition to that is this concept of self-regulation. We as human beings can become very dysregulated. A lot of the issues, a lot of the wounds inflicted upon children in their childhood are as a result of dysregulated adults in their lives. Adults that did not know how to regulate their emotions, they were never taught, it's not their fault. But this is a really big concept and Salah helps us to regulate ourselves in a sense that in the morning when you wake up, you have the highest amount of self-control, right? And as the day goes on, your self-control ability to self-regulate your emotions and states or emotional states decreases. It greatly diminishes because you're more tired. And so if you think about it, in the morning we have Salat al-Fajr, right, which starts off our day. This is a keystone habit when we talk about habits and then science of habits. And I highly recommend everybody to read. Um, um, uh, Sorry, I forget the name, but it's by James Clear. And he talked about atomic habits, right? And, and it's really downsizing our habits to a very small size in order for us to be able to incorporate them into our daily routine. And then you can build upon them. And we talk about keystone habits. They're really a type of habits that you can actually build other habits upon them. And so for example, making your bed could be a keystone habit because when you make your bed in the morning, you can actually do other things um, because I was able to make my bed. So I can go and make my coffee. I can make breakfast. I can do all these other things. For us, it's Salat al-Fajr. And for every act, we also have a dua that mentally prepares us to engage in that act. So we don't jump into anything, if you really think about it, if it's done right. But do we maximize upon the potential uh, and power that our faith actually gives us? Do we actually know these things and do we implement them? So there's there's a dua upon waking up, right? There's also, um, you know, certain certain adi'ah that the Prophet ﷺ used to make. And then there's there's a dua, right? When you get up and you make wudu. Um, and then after wudu, right? Then you enter into the kingdom of your Lord. You, you are now ready to enter into the kingdom of, of speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is a form of mental preparation, which is what dua does, but then physically I can then engage in the act. So we have Salat al-Fajr, which is a keystone habit upon which after I pray Fajr, I can technically do everything else. I can start working, I can go downstairs, I can make coffee, I can make breakfast, I can clean, I can organize, I can do that which I am responsible to do as part of my different responsibilities and duties for the day. But there is a big gap, if you think about it, between Fajr and Dhuhr prayer. Now, why is that? This really relates to this concept of self-regulation and self-control because you don't need as much adjustment or attunement or, or tuning, sorry, to, um, you don't really need a tune-up. You don't need to tune up your self-control and self-regulation because you already have high amounts of it in the morning. Now, then you have dhuhr, and then you have a gap, and then you also have asra and maghrib, which tend to be in close proximity, and then you have isha. So you have several um, salat in the evening, you know, that you actually have to partake in. And that is because, again, our self-control diminishes as the day goes on. We are more and more tired so we need more check-ins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need more tune-ups. We need to fine tune so that we can up our self-control, not fall into sinning because there are also studies that show that crimes and technically sins are committed more in the evenings. And that is that relates to self-control and self-regulation, your ability to do those things. 
Now, tahajjud as well um, leads, if, if you really want, you know, want to increase your capacity to be able to handle stressors and things that happen to you, it's engaging in tahajjud, which is waking up, even if it means 10 minutes before fajr comes in, fajr adhan comes in, you can actually just wake up 10 minutes and pray two rakahs, four rakahs, your shafa and witr, and then you have sealed your your prayers for the evening and then you're ready to to uh, engage in the next day and what you will find is that your capacity to be able to handle stressors greatly increases and that is because you're tapping into the reservoir of your spiritual capacity directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and anything directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equips you with the ability to be able to handle much more than you think you can handle so whenever you're in a state of worry or anxiety about not being able to handle that which is coming your way, or you know that you have a sick loved one and the inevitable is happening, especially due to COVID um, or other sicknesses and ailments. This is one great way of maximizing your capacity to be able to handle the emotional stressors that are coming your way, as well as tapping into professional help and support. Now this, this image um, is from, um, you know, a, a group of clinicians that have, you know, uh, institutionalized, um, you know, different um, strategies and techniques in mental health. And so they have um, come up with this infographic, which talks about four strategies for managing stress and anxiety, but they also are very applicable to self care. Now you can do meditation, you can do deep breathing, and I really um, encourage diaphragmatic breathing really learning how to breathe properly, which is actually part of a Tibb al-Nabawi, the medicine of the prophet, it is discussed how you need to utilize the lungs capacity for breathing because many people just breathe in a very shallow way. And when you learn how to tap into diaphragmatic breathing, diaphragmatic breathing triggers your rest and digest and takes you slowly into a state of safety in which you're now in the green zone you're taken out of the red zone and into the green zone, but you still need that physical activity or that sense of you know, activation of safety in some way. You can also do visualization. Visualiz visualization is extremely powerful in the sense of visualizing yourself in a place of safety because you may not be in a, in a physical place of safety. You may not live in a household in which you actually feel safe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his infinite mercy, has given us the ability to imagine things. And you can actually imagine yourself being in a safer place, in a place that is more serene, that is perhaps more calm. Maybe you live with many children and you aren't really able to escape very often. So you actually can imagine yourself being, uh, you know, um, by a beach or in a very serene place in nature somewhere. And that gives you a sense of peace and safety. Also, you have expressive and creative strategies in order to arrive at a place of balance. And that is gardening, art, and physical movement. And we talked a little bit about physical movement, especially hiking and research studies that point to the fact that hiking can actually help in rewiring the brain. So hiking is very healthy for you, especially during this time in which people are homebound you can actually go out in nature and hike and make sure that it's not a crowded location. And being around nature that glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can only bring you peace and serenity. Now, the third is reflection and exploration strategies. And this is exactly, this is derived from our own practices of muraqaba and muhasaba um, and, and mujahada and all these different concepts of really observing myself and, and, and journaling and making observations about myself and how I impact other people. And what is my presence like? What does it feel like to be in my presence and being in touch with that? Um, so self-monitoring uh, communication is key as well. Learning how to communicate is the biggest skill that you can learn in your life because that upon that, every single relationship will rely. Um, number four, we can't neglect this, of course, as part of not spiritual health care, but physical self care, sorry, um, is learning how to eat well, and not just learning how to eat well, but where do I 
um, purchase my food? Is it ethically sourced? Is it organic? Is it nutritious? As much as I can. And of course, I understand individuals who say, well, that is a very expensive lifestyle. However, your sickness is much more expensive. It's much more expensive to cater to and maintain. Um, and paying all of those bills is, is much worse than investing in healthy food um, that is actually nutritious for your body, that can actually sustain your body and keep you going. And this is part of our wajib. This is part of our responsibility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being able to learn this because it is a science in and of itself. Um, uh, I'm blessed to have my sister who's a holistic nutritionist and she um, really guides a lot of um, my information regarding this and, and enables me to be able to help clients as well in this area um, through connecting with her. But I highly recommend that you know every single individual um, create some type of awareness around this topic as it's very critical for our well-being. And there is a gut and brain connection through the vagus nerve. So I'm not going to feel well if I don't eat right. And if I'm consuming carbs and sugars and, and you know um, toxins, there is no way that I will mentally feel well because my gut is signaling to my brain through the vagus nerve, the largest nerve in the body, that I'm actually, um, the fuel that you are receiving is, is not um, top-notch fuel. And so you actually need better fuel sources in order to feel better. Um, and of course, relationships, connection, it's huge. I, I kind of mentioned that earlier and exercise. And then last but not least, understanding, and I hope through this presentation that we have all collectively uh, come to understand that without self-care, there is no health and well-being. And this is actually a necessity. This is not a luxury. It's not about painted nails and massage parlors and, you know, going to, um, you know, just uh, get a treat for myself. That can be part of it, but it's much greater than that. It's actually much bigger than that. And so self-care is a necessity. It's not a choice in order to fulfill the rights of the amena that we were given. And then, you know, self-care is never a selfish act. It is only good stewardship of the only gift I have. The gift I was put on earth to offer others through the different types of contributions and services that we are each mukallaf with, that we are each responsible um, to fulfill for others through us. We are just the vehicle. Um, I thank everyone for listening. And if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to respond to them at this time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi I have a doubt about, you talked about three things that make us um, feel that we are having self-care. That yeah. was um, that was safety. Mm -hmm. um, Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Well. Fulfillment and satisfaction and connection. Yeah, what if we don't have it? How do we build that? Yeah, so it, you, I'm guessing you have one or two of them, but you don't have all of them. Yeah. And if you have one or two of them, there, you know, human beings are very resilient in the sense that you don't necessarily have to have every single one of those in order to thrive. But for example, if I live by myself and I don't really have many uh, connections with other people, then I can maximize on my relationship with my creator in order to overcompensate for the physical relationships that I actually don't have with other people around me, for example. Um, and I can ensure that I'm eating well and I can ensure that I'm exercising, um, taking care of myself. But also, um, I think sometimes individuals don't want to put themselves out there to be able to create a sense of community for themselves, which is really important in the sense of, um, you know, finding platforms. And especially now with us being online, there are many different support groups, many different platforms 
in which we can come to know about. And then we can, which we, even if it's the Quran halakha that you are a part of, and the women in this Quran circle um, all check in on one another, that is a sense of connection, you know, and I, and I get a sense of safety that, you know, I am cared about. And of course, primarily, we get a sense that we are loved and cared for by our creator because we were created. We would never have been created if we're not loved and cared for, uh, cared for and nurtured by our creator. And so that is the first sense that we can connect to. And then other than our creator, we do our part in a sense of trying to create ways in which we can be connected to other people um, in order to maximize on the benefits of connection in our body and in our mental states and mental well-being. Um, and then also, you know, spending time in nature is very healing, um, much more than I can cover today. But just being in nature, being in the sunshine, um, you know, getting a good night's sleep. And even if it's, it's really the perceived support that you have, it's not about having six to 10 people who are you are, who you are close to in your life. It's really about um, my sense, you know, do I feel like I have support? That's really all that it comes down to. So even if you only have two people, then that's all that you really need. You don't need anything beyond that because I feel like I'm loved and cared for by those two people. So I don't need a whole tribe. I don't need a whole community. Um, it's really perceived support that I have. And if I perceive that I have support, then that's good enough. Okay. That, I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah. Jazakallah khair. Um, Heba, for a, a beautiful talk, mashallah. Nissa is very, very grateful. Um, it's been recorded, alhamdulillah, so I'm hoping more, inshallah, will benefit from listening to what you've shared with us today. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping we will collaborate and partner with you again in the future, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you so much for your time. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who joined in today. Jazakallah khair, my dear. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. You're welcome. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Take care, everyone.